So the first words I utter to myself besides my prayer is gratitude. I want to thank the Lord for the gifts he's given me and for my ability to share those gifts with other people. Because if I hold on to those gifts and don't share them, I'm being selfish. Because I think it, without the proper communication skills, we're misunderstood that when you ask somebody to be quiet, you have to think about why you're asking them that because they matter. Maybe you should listen to what they're saying. So if a student walks into your school and they make a complaint, like, oh man, this one's complaining again. Oh, you just lost an opportunity, right, Tommy? Yeah, you did. You lost an opportunity because that person who is complaining cares, but it's how we look at it. Yes, they may be complaining because they want things certain ways, but is there value to it? Are we listening? So the most important thing in speaking is being quiet. Master of, of none because you try to do everything. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you for that saying, it's jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. yeah. And that's 100% true. But for me, it was mastering one thing at a time. And when I mastered it, I never gave it up. I continued playing it. That's why for me, even today, I still train martial arts seven days a week. I'm not one of those guys who said, yeah, look at my pictures. Look what I used to do when I was in my 20s. I train every day. I'm willing to fight every day. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Seven Figure Secrets Podcast. Jennifer Waters here, joined by my dad, Tommy Siegler. And we have a really incredible guest today, Sifu Raphael. How you doing, Sifu? Exceptional. I always say getting better every day because I believe that I need to get better every day. I love it. Well, for those of you who, who might not be familiar with Sifu Raphael, uh, he's an entrepreneur, founder of Speaking Prowess, hosts six live shows. I'm sure we'll dig into that in a little bit. That's a lot of lives. I mean, I do a lot of lives, but that's a lot. It's martial artist, owns a school, um, a 10,000 square foot facility in New York, and has combined his expertise in martial arts as well as in communication. So I'm really excited uh, for this opportunity. Thanks uh, for coming on again. We're, we're super pumped to have you, sir. Absolutely. So, so Sifu, tell us a little bit about your, your journey, kind of what inspired you overall to maybe switch from just being a martial artist to becoming a school owner and now starting Speaking Prowess. Uh, I mean, just kind of walk us through that, please. So early on, I, I understood how movement inspires us all. And when I lost the ability to move, I actually had polio as a kid. Oh, wow. And that really made me think no one else can help me walk again, except so that communication started way early on. I was uh, probably around three years old. And so I lost the ability to walk for a couple of years. And thank God for the doctors. They I wore braces like Forrest Gump um, <laughs> for me to walk. 10, 10 feet, probably take me an hour once I started learning how to walk again. And so understanding that, yes, I had people helping me and guiding me, but it was up to me to make the difference in my life. So movement is what really, really has inspired my whole existence. And understanding movement is what brought me to become a martial artist, because I realized that martial arts is just a different way of communicating with my body and with other people. And so for me, it's always been fascinating and I got into fitness right away. So it's not just martial artists. I've been a fitness expert. I've coached other fitness experts. And it's always been about movement. And I think that my whole life on that one thing. Wow. That's, that's, that's awesome. That's really fascinating. So you're cl clearly passionate about empowering individuals to reach their potential. What sparked this passion and how did you integrate it into your work as an executive coach? When, when we consider the way we look at the world, for me, it started early on. I, I saw somebody with disabilities and I had this crazy thought in my head and I said, wow, they can't communicate. So if I went over there and I hurt them, they couldn't tell anybody. And so I had this, this judgment call. I don't know why I had that thought. And I could have gone over there and hurt this kid who was a cousin of mine and he couldn't speak. But instead, I realized that I can be better than the person who would hurt him. I could be the person that would give him a smile. So I went over there and played with him instead. 
But that thought that I can hurt this person and nobody would know about it really drove me on how I can be in the world. And I think that has has helped my trajectory and and helping people all along. So if I'm understanding, yeah, yeah. So if I'm understanding, like there's a little bit of a theme here around like disabilities, right? Like or or impact health wise, like you had polio. Um, I can't imagine, you know, all the things that you had to go through to, to physically get moving. And then you're recognizing this need in other people. It sounds like you, you stand up a lot for people who maybe can't stand up for themselves. Is that a little bit more of the, the drive for working with kids, working with adults and, and trying to, to do some of these other things? Absolutely. So uh, it's very interesting. I've been called the child whisperer because when parents bring their kids to me, they're like, how can you get him or her to do what I can't? I'm like, well, it is because I'm not you. That's one. Right. And the other, because empathy, right? I think empathy comes in big. So I work a lot with autistic kids uh, from young on. Uh, I, I, I've had uh, autistic adults. Actually, I have an autistic adult. He's about 65 years old. And I am the only one, and he's been training since he's 11, I am the only one that ever made him a black belt because I saw what he, don't get me wrong, it took him 16 years, but I never gave up on him. As long as he was willing to do his due diligence to work for it. And right now I'm working with another kid, he's 23 years old, and he is high level autistic, but he doesn't get it. Uh, And my heart breaks because I know that this kid will never, ever be able to live on his own. I've dealt with kids who couldn't speak and they would hit themselves. So when their parents brought them over, they're like, oh my God, what can you do? I said, let's start with one step at a time. So when I, when I can have a kid hit a speed bag or even do jump rope and the parents are like, wow, my kid is doing this. And I'm like, yeah, we just got to give them a chance because we don't know what they're capable of until we put it in front of them. So for me, it's always finding a way and whether you're autistic or high functioning and you you have no disabilities, you have such great potential inside of you that maybe no one put that obstacle in front of you so that you can jump over it. So for me, it's always about seeing the person as a person, right. as a human being that we can make an impact. We um we had a young man that was with us. He trained for seven, maybe eight years. Um, and also, um, uh, autistic, um, uh, also downs and autistic. So a little, a little bit combined uh, of both, but, um, amazing individual, you know, it's, it took him longer. It, It did, but, you know, um, super fun guy, always happy, you know, to, to be at the school, to be training, um, to be doing those things. And, and I know that, uh, and as it, it's hard cause they need to be in the adult class, right. Or you need to work with them as an adult. You still need to do that. But sometimes it's the, we got to work at the level of a child just because of the comprehension that's there. Yeah. yeah. So For example, I mean, this, this one kid, he's 23, but he's got the mind of a five-year-old. Mm. Yeah. And I've taken, uh, he can't be in a regular class, so he does one-on-ones with me. Mm -hmm. And he comes twice a week. And he does 45-minute sessions with me. Great. And he went, he's now an orange belt. So I go white, yellow, orange, so he's into my third belt. And sometimes he comes in, he is frustrated, he is mad. (laughs) So, of course, I say, well, we got to let that out. Let's go hit Bob. And for anybody listening who doesn't know who Bob is, <laughs> yeah. bag, it's called a bo- body opponent bag. So yeah. I said, take it out. You know, sometimes I've taken him through meditation where he's like, I don't want to meditate. He's so angry that actually when he leaves, he's like about to go to sleep. And then he comes and, and he looks at me and I go, you know, I love you, right? He goes, I love you too, Sifu. And then he gives me a hug. But it's, it's a moment like that. When we can help somebody who can't help themselves, mm. man, that is so rewarding. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, is. is that is that why you know you started moving more into leadership? Like 
you know, kind of tying those dots, being an instructor. And then because, I mean, when we connected before, it was primarily you were doing martial arts, but it seems like you're leaning a little bit more into leadership, business. Yeah, just kind of walk us through through that. Sure. When you and I connected that one time, uh, the martial arts was one of my businesses. That's all we spoke about. You didn't know I had other yeah. businesses. So um, for me, it's always been, I think I, I went into leadership position at a very early age, and this is how I did it. I took care of me first. So I was on the gymnastics team. And I went in high school and I went to a different high school and I taught gymnastics. Now, when I tried out for the gymnastics team, the coach looked at me and just looked away. And I said, excuse me, is there a gymnastics tryout today? He turns around and looks at me. He goes, yeah, what do you want? I said, well, I'm here to try out. He goes, no. I said, why not? It's tryouts. No. I said, well, what do I have to do to try out? He goes, you're too tall. You're not going to be on my team. I'm like, can I still try? He goes, no. I said, well, I'm going to go talk to the principal. He goes, okay, what could you do? So I learned how to flip on the street. So flipping for me on concrete was no big deal. So we were standing on a wooden floor in the gym. The mats were over at the other side of the gym. I started flipping right on the, on the wooden floor. And he turns around, he goes, you're on the team. <laughs> so immediately he saw what I had. And then when I went to the handball team, guess who the coach was? Same coach. <laughs> he goes, oh, you again. I'm like, yeah. He goes, what do you got? I said, well, you know, let, let me play. He goes, okay, he, let me play. I beat everyone on the team and I was a ninth grader. I beat the captain of the team. I be, and then I said, okay. I, he goes, okay, you're on the team. I said, okay, I want to play singles. He goes, no, that's only reserved for the captain. I said, I beat your captain. I said, I'll beat him again. And it wasn't that I was being cocky. It was being that I spent countless of hours training on how to do what I did. So, and I played him again and I beat him again. And it was a ridiculous score. And what wound up happening is, I was just proving myself to the coach not to diminish the captain. So the captain, the, the coach said to me, listen, it's his last year, so we're going to leave him as captain. I said, absolutely. I wasn't trying to take anything away from him. I just wanted to play singles. He goes, next year, you can be captain. You can play singles. I said, only if no one else beats me. If anybody beats me, they should be captain. They should be playing singles. But so I played, you know, for the whole time. And for me, it's always about, and I talked about the movement. So when I look at something, when I play a game or I do an activity, and it's that old saying, you know, you know master of, of none because you try to do everything. Jack right? of all trades. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you for that saying. It's jack of all trades, master of none. Yeah. yeah. And that's a hundred percent true. But for me, it was mastering one thing at a time. And when I mastered it, I never gave it up. I continued playing it. That's why for me, even today, I still train martial arts seven days a week. I'm not one of those guys who said, yeah, look at my pictures. Look what I used to do when I was in my twenties. I train every day. I'm willing to fight every day because what kind of a coach can I be if I'm not in the game? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people try to coach on what worked, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago without actually getting into the day to day. I think that's one of the things that we focus a lot on, um, obviously with our students inside of our school, but also when we're working with, with other businesses as well, it's just, being able to say what we're doing on a regular basis because we're actually experiencing because we're actually going through those steps. So yeah. totally get what you're saying there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Dad, maybe we want to talk about the speaking prowess and, and a little yeah. bit more about that. I'm, I'm interested in the, the speaking prowess and, and, uh, and, and the mission you have with that. Can you tell us more about it and yeah, what's it all about and all that good stuff? Sure. So, for me, 
when, when I was going through my, I'm, I'm going to say growth, because I needed to grow into a different person. I, I could not stay a disabled person. And I've never even considered myself a disabled person. I just couldn't walk. That did not make me less than. So my communication started back at three years old. I had to communicate with myself. I was alone. No one else can do what I can do because nobody could do it for me. They can help me. They can assist me. But I was there on this journey alone. It was me. It was my communication with myself. And that's where I've always understood how important communication is. And so it's always been, how do I communicate with somebody? You know, when you own a, a martial arts school, the, the main goal for most people is how many members can I get? How can I sell this person? Why am I not selling that person? I had a coach early on and they said to me, you know, you're not selling correctly. You got to look at every person who comes through your front door as a as a prize, look at them as your vacation, look at them as your new car, look at this, at, at this, at this watch. At the, and I, and that lasted 30 seconds for me because I said, I wow. look, and he was a high, highly paid coach. And I said, that's not me. Yeah. Look at a person for the monetary, I got to look at them as a human being. And so how do I communicate to someone in a broader spectrum, a, a level where we can make them feel valued? And so many people walk around this world thinking they're worth less. Yes. You are. They're worth so much. They have gifts. Every morning I wake up and I, I wake up in gratitude. I go to sleep in gratitude. In the middle of the day, I, I, I look at gratitude. I look at everything that I've had my whole life. And so when we think about speaking, the first words that we utter in our own mind will change who we are. So the first words I utter to myself besides my prayer is gratitude. I want to thank the Lord for the gifts he's given me and for my ability to share those gifts with other people. Because if I hold on to those gifts and don't share them, I'm being selfish. Right. So initially, I have to think about that. So speaking prowess has always been in my mind. And when I decided to truly, it's been coming to fruition probably once I started doing podcasting because I, I, really started to understand the words that we use, how we make somebody feel, how we make somebody even act or react. So every word we say lands. What are you saying that lands? How does it land in somebody's heart? How does it land in somebody's mind? How does your actions and your words coincide? So mm -hmm. speaking prowess is truly something that has been inside of me since since that time when I couldn't walk. And now it's come full circle to say, okay, now you need to give other people a voice, a voice so that they can be understood. So when I started on this journey, I've been grabbing the most amazing people to join me on it. So I have communication experts from literally all over the world, from, from the uh, UK, Australia, Germany, France, Dominican Republic, Mexico, um, and Switzerland even. And, and when we can all come together and instill communication into someone so that they are not misunderstood because I think it, without the proper communication skills, we're misunderstood. Mm. And a lot of times it's about framing it. What, one of the things that I, I teach to people, the clients that I teach is, before you have a conversation with someone, how important is that conversation? 
Are you right. speaking to your spouse? Are you speaking to your children? Are you speaking to your friends? Or are you speaking to a colleague? Or you're looking for venture capital? Every conversation should be important. So you need to pause. You need to understand that whatever comes out will land. And how do you want it to land? So that's why I'm so passionate about speaking prowess and helping people put not only what they're thinking, but to reframe it. So I, I teach my clients that sometimes before you have a conversation, practice it. Mm -hmm. if, if you want to talk to your spouse about <clears throat> this, right, that's going to be important, that's going to affect the, the family life, don't just blurt it out. <laughs> talk it out by yourself. Talk it out and then give them a chance to understand. And even sometimes when we speak to people, we make the mistake of thinking they understood us. And the key words that we can usually say is, do you understand what I'm saying? And can you please tell me in your words what I just said? And man, that has cleared up so many communications, not only for myself, for my clients. I think that's a huge, a huge aspect. You know, um, one of the things that, that we often have to work on a, a lot uh, with business owners is communicating the value that they have through what they do. You know, mm -hmm. internally, you can know because of the history of changing people's lives. I know that the people who come in the door need their life changed because of what I've seen happen, but they don't know that, you know? So communicating, Hey, in order for you to have this life transformation that you're seeking, everything that we've done in the past for these other people, I've got to be able to communicate in a way that is going to allow you to see the value. And I feel like that's what you're saying just in conversations in general. So is speaking prowess more of a platform? Is it a program that people jump into? Like, what exactly are, are you doing with all these different communication experts you mentioned? So we are doing, we're about to launch our website where people can come in and, and take courses. But the difference between speaking prowess and any other course program out there is that we're actually going to hold people's hands. We're going to keep them accountable. So, for example, if you come and you take a course, there's two grades you can get on this course. Everybody's going to be graded, and everybody's going to have a certificate at the end. Here's the grades. First grade, incomplete. You didn't do the work. You did not do your due diligence. Second grade, A. So we're only looking for people who are either going to continue <clears throat> forward to getting the A and we're going to hold their hand. So in the courses that we have set up, there's going to be videos, there's going to be action plans, there's going to be quizzes. And every quiz is going to have certain questions. And if you take that quiz and you get eight out of ten, we're going to ask you to take it again. And we're going to ask you to take it again. And we're going to ask you to take it again so that you and maybe go back to that portion that you're missing on and clear it up for you. And so that until you get that 10 out of 10, that's your A grade. And we're going to do that throughout the course until the end of the course where we actually give you a test so that you can walk away with the knowledge. So there's a lot of courses out there that you can take the course, take it, forget about it and move on. We're mm -hmm. not doing it. So the, that's not, that's only a, a small component of it. The other one is we're going to have master classes every month. The other one is we're going to have coaching one on one on 10. So one of the instructors will come on and they'll coach 10 people who are taking their course. Only 10, we're going to keep it small. So it's more intimate and they will guide them along the way. The other thing that we're doing is we're having a private community so people can go, hey, I'm in this course, I, I don't understand this, or I did this, but I'm not getting it, so that the instructors will also be part of that 
community. So they'll come in and they'll share. And then each person can share with each other. So we're mm-hmm. building this huge infrastructure where people can come in and not only get what they need, but then we're also doing it for corporations where we're going to white label all of our courses if they so choose. So we can say, instead of saying speaking prowess, we're going to white label it to Tommy's dealership, right? Mm -hmm. To Jennifer's martial arts school, to whoever it is. So we are going to give them training for their employees, their instructors, whoever it is. For example, and what the way we're reframing it is also for a corporation. If a reporter talk to the janitor, can the janitor deliver the right message about your company or not? Mm. Right. So the janitor to the middle management to the CEO should all be on the same page, but a lot of companies are not. So we can white label it so that they feels like it's theirs. Plus, we also come in and we can work where we come in and we give workshops. I have a facility here. It's about 3,500 square feet. It's a, it's a school where we actually are teaching courses. We're teaching workshops where we're having uh, different instructors coming in. We have professors coming in. Our principals of schools, different people. We have people who've been DJs, um, uh, radio DJs who understand communication. We have every, we have writing coaches. We have people who help people in Hollywood. So we have a variety of different ways of how to communicate. So when you come to speaking prowess, we're going to deliver communication in all aspects, body language, facial language, hand gestures. How do you move from one position to the other? How to speak on a stage? I've spoken on so many different stages and I have some people who are TEDx speakers as well. We're going to are part of the plan. So we're going to teach someone how even how to get on a TEDx stage. Mm. We're going to teach people how to uh, deliver at a conference. We're going to teach somebody how to deliver to a CEO, even somebody who wants to go and become an entrepreneur or somebody who's going to apply for a job. So we have yeah. the variety to give to everyone. Is that, you know, a part of the the method to your madness of having six different live shows? Like explain that to me. <laughs> you know, that's a, a little <laughs> mind boggling. You know, I I do, you know, one live show a week. Obviously, we have this uh, this um, podcast that we're doing right now is not necessarily live, but we're we're shooting it. So why six? Like what's what's going on with that? I I probably could have more, but let me tell you. (laughs) You don't have enough time. Another another day. Um, Well, one of the things for me, um, I don't set an alarm to wake up, but I have probably 30 alarms in my day on when to do certain things so that I don't skip anything. So I show up because if I don't show up, then I am not the person I'd claim to be. So I must always show up. I always set my alarms early enough. If I have an appointment here, there, wherever it is, if I even have to, all my classes are scheduled, every, all my podcasts, everything is live. And if I, so I don't put an alarm to wake up because I'm usually up sometimes at 4 a.m. So like this morning, it was three something. And it's not that I don't, I don't like to sleep. It's that I'm on a mission and I wake up fresh. I mean, I can go for a run. I can go dancing. I can go swimming. I could do whatever it is because my mission is bigger than me to impact more people. So six shows, to be honest with you, COVID is what brought the shows about because I lost zero members during COVID for my martial arts school. And I know that's a little weird and strange, but it's because I communicate it with my clients. I was already doing things on, on, on Zoom. I already, I have clients around the world for martial arts because I teach them. And so I said to all my clients, I send them an email, text message, even some of them who I, I realized didn't open it. I called them and I said, hey, we have to shut down. It was Monday. I said, take tomorrow off, but we're coming back on Wednesday. And the, this is the schedule. I was teaching seven classes Monday through Friday. And I did that for the entire time we were closed. And that communication allowed me to keep all my clients. If anything, I gained more clients. I gained clients in Arizona, in Florida, in Texas. I gained clients around the world because I was doing something. It wasn't just punching and kicking. And there's nothing wrong with punching and kicking, but it was exercises on 
how do we do certain things? I would, I would make the kids go and everybody's going to get a prize. Who's got a red umbrella? So they would have to scramble and look for an umbrella. Okay. Who can bring me a, a green crayon? Okay. Uh, who can draw the circle the fastest? And then it was about them thinking on their feet and doing things. And then I would, for some of the classes, for the older ones, I would say, okay, today we're going to learn the martial arts from Thailand. Today we're going to learn the martial arts from the Philippines. We're going to learn the martial arts from Japan. We're going to learn the martial arts from Germany, the, the most prominent ones that are being done there. And then I would do my research and then share that with them. And that's what kept them coming because they didn't know what I was going to do. They're like, oh, my God, what is Sifu up to today? He's <laughs> crazy. It was interesting. And one of the things that the parents said to me, I don't know how you do it, but could you not stop? My kids look forward to taking class with you. And I didn't limit them to the, you can only come on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's a virtual class. Everybody could come. That even one of my kids' parents, the dad who was not really, you know, he's like, why is my child doing this martial arts? And she said, are you crazy? There's no way we're going to stop. Did you know that Sifu Raphael was running virtual classes before his school was. His school took a week to put things together. He was running right away. And my son is learning stuff. It never stopped learning. It wasn't a review of what he's already known. He moved up in rank. He got promoted. Right. He got stripes, yeah. all these things. So, and then I said, oh, people are they're overwhelmed with Zoom. And you guys know we were all overwhelmed with Zoom. So yeah. this is how my first show started. And I know I went around a long way. I apologize for that. It's all right. That's what we're here for. But the most important thing that I realize is people have to work on Zoom. They're stuck at home. They're doing all these things. So I said, okay. I'm going to do two things for the parents because I'm already doing tons for the kids and, and the adults who are taking my classes. But how about the parents who never want to do martial arts? And we have those parents. Every martial arts student studio out there cannot tell me every martial arts that, member that I have, their parents are doing it because they would right. be lying, right? <laughs> Not every martial arts yeah. artist, their parents don't want to do it. They, they make a thousand excuses and that's on them, not on us. But we always bring the best value to our members, and hopefully the parents go, I want some of that too. So I said, what are the two things I can do for the adults? So the first one is I said to my adult black belts, I said, hey, guys, I know we're doing classes all week. I said, why don't we do something special on Saturday? And we'll do it, you know, 10 in the morning. No big deal. That's where you guys can... I said, let's do coffee with Sifu. And we will talk about, you guys can ask me anything. We can talk about anything. And let's do it for an hour. Don't wear your uniforms. Have a cup of coffee. We'll just chill out. We'll talk. It went, from, it went from an hour to an hour and a half to two hours to like, what are we talking about next week? <laughs> so what I did for all the parents who were not my black belts, I said, hey, guys, Every Saturday at 7 p.m., we're going to have a cocktail party. We'll all <laughs> have a cocktail. We'll have a party. We'll shoot the breeze. How was your day? What's going on? How's work? And people were loving it. So I said, huh, people are enjoying this. So I was going to do a podcast about martial arts. And that's when I started doing my dig. I love martial arts. It's... It's a good living. But how many times can you talk about punching and kicking and choking somebody out? <laughs> yeah, it's it old after a while. And so I started listening to martial arts podcasts, and guess what? None of them lived probably more than 50 shows. Most mm. of them died after 20. 
So I said, what can I talk about? And the, when I realized that I've been a coach my whole life, martial arts, I used to go into zero period before school started in high school and teach swimming to people who didn't know how to swim. So I've always been a coach. I've known coaches. I know um, people who, uh, and, and the UFC, their coaches, I've trained with them, all these different things. I know all different kinds of coaches. I said, that's who I need to talk to. And when I dug in deep, there was coaching calls, but it was specific to a sport. It's a football, baseball, hockey, boxing, all these different shows on a specific sport. And I said, how about the music teacher? How about the math teacher? How about the dance teacher? I said, they count and they impact. How about the business coach? How about the martial arts coach who's helping other martial arts instructors? How about them? I said, that's who I want to talk to. And that's how Coaching Call started. And so I believed in coaching my whole life. I've been coached. I've coached. So that's my first show. You guys want to hear how I got to my other shows? It's up to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, it sounds like... You've got lots of different shows, um, different topics, I'm assuming, like you've got the coaching show and the, what just kind of what are the topics for the, the other shows that you have? So really quick, I, I'll make it short on this. So the next one is called Heroes Rising, because I believe all coaches are heroes. Your first coaches were your mom, your dad, uh, people that influence you. But now I believe coaches are heroes. So I do another one with a guy named Jose Escobar. He's an amazing coach. And we bring two coaches on and we talk about a topic that's going to help other people. So every show that I do, it's about helping people. So that's called Heroes Rising. And the next one is called Business Prowess, and I do that with a publicist. And we do that one on business. So we only speak on business, business topics, ideas, SOPs. How do we run a business from you know having 10 employees to having 1,000 employees? And we brought all kinds of business people on the show. The other one is the SEER show, and that's Seeking the Truth on Health, Fitness, and Mindset. And then the other one is called New Tip Daily, and that's where a coach comes on or somebody who's an expert in their field, and they come and share a tip or two, and that's my shortest show. That's about 15 minutes. And then the new one that's about to launch is called Speaking Prowess, and that's all on communication. So mm. they all kind of wrap around how do we help. Yeah, Love man. It. With all the people that you work with, and, and you, you're working with a bunch of people, I can tell you that right now, you probably have encountered just a wide range of challenges. You know, you know when you work with this many people, you're gonna have you're gonna have challenges. Some people would say you have opportunities. I like this, I like that even better. What do you believe are some of the challenges or, or opportunities that entrepreneurs or school owners face when it comes to growing their business? <clears throat> Let's let's talk about school owners for a second, because I am sure. one. You guys are one. Yeah. Tommy, how long have you had your school? <laughs> Jeez. Well, eight, 1982 is when I got here in Augusta, and I started teaching when I got here. For that, Before that, I was teaching for other people. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, here in Augusta, since 1982. Wow. So, long time. Yeah. yeah. Well, now, it wasn't successful, <laughs> but I've been teaching. So <laughs> I say it wasn't successful because I was also working a full-time job, construction, and teaching martial arts as a part-time job. And, you know, 14, 15 years ago, we flipped that around. So now okay. it's martial arts. Yeah. So when you got started, you did it because you had a passion, right? Oh, and, yeah. And you decided that people matter. Yeah, for sure. So you, you say you weren't successful because it didn't pay the bills the way you wanted it to. But imagine that person that you taught your first student. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it mattered there. That didn't matter. It did. The the reward was was being able to communicate martial arts to some to other people and and being able to um, pour myself into them so that they could see the value that I brought and they, they in turn taught me. So, uh, because you learn from everybody, uh, the money came later, 
you, you, you got to plant the seed before you, you, you get the fruit. So, so, and then Jennifer, I mean, wow, you grew up with a dad who has a passion for martial arts. Yeah, for sure. You are so fortunate. Wow. Yes. Congratulations to both of you. Thank because you. now you're working together, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Day in, day out. <laughs> Love it. And you're doing shows together. Wow. Look at that. Yeah. Incredible. So I, I think the, the, the most important thing um, that we're all sharing here is people matter. Mm -hmm. And a lot of martial arts are opened and they close right away because they forget that. They forget mm -hmm. that it's the people. It's not the money. If you open up a martial arts school and you're expecting like that coach try to tell me, look at that person. They're, they're a BMW. Oh, man, mm -hmm. you uh, yeah. Close that school. That school will fail for sure. But if you look at a person coming into your school and you and Jennifer, you, you talked about it earlier, how you can show them that what you've learned, they're getting all at once, right? Right. That speaks volumes. When you can look at a person and say, without this huge ego, because I'm going to say it out loud. And most martial arts instructors, their ego hits the door before they do. Yes, 1,000% would agree with you on that. <laughs> such a turn off. Such a turn off. All the time. Yeah. It's such a turn off that I stopped going to martial arts events because of that. Because it was the same story, the same story, the same story. And it's like, Oh. And so for me, people matter. And when we can make that happen, that's why you guys are successful. This is why I didn't lose a member during COVID. If anything, I gained members. I was asked by the school board to do PTA meetings and to do some classes for the school because of the way I taught. I'm not tooting my own horn my members did that for me. It wasn't that I mattered, is that they mattered. And when you make other people matter, the money will come. So school owners, you need to understand that when you ask somebody to be quiet, you have to think about why you're asking them that. Because they matter. Maybe you should listen to what they're saying. So if a st student walks into your school and they make a complaint, you're like, oh, man, this one's complaining again. Oh, you just lost an opportunity, right, Tommy? Yeah, you did. You lost an opportunity because that person who is complaining cares. But it's how we look at it. Yes, they may be complaining because they want things certain ways. But is there value to it? Are we listening? So the most important thing in speaking is being quiet and listening. And I think we forget that. As school owners, it's my way or the highway. Because I learned a hard way. I was beaten. I was done this and I was done that. And... When does the buck stop? When do you beat your students into submission instead of letting them submit themselves to want to learn? That's the value that we have to bring as instructors and listen to them. And, and, and kind of, listen, right now, every day when my members come to class, I pick one kid who's student of the day. Every kid gets a sticker. The student of the day, I have a prize. They have uh, two things they can choose. One is a gold coin. It's a, it's a plastic gold coin you can buy on Amazon. Yeah. You know, I'm coming to your school and giving away gold, gold coins. <laughs> it's, a, it's a treasure chest, right? But you can either yeah. have a treasure chest or a gold coin. 
Yeah. Here's the cool thing that I'm teaching the kids. You can choose the toys in the gold, in the chest, or you can get a gold coin. And you see this, this shelf right here with all different kinds of books and different toys and really, really cool things. Your parents can buy these books. I have all kinds of different books. I have different toys. And they're shiny and they're bright and they look like fun. But being student of the day doesn't give you that. You can get a gold coin and save. You need 10 gold coins to get something from the shelf. What does that tell the kids? It teaches them how to behave better in class, how to do their best. It teaches them something that we are lacking in, in the foundation for our children is to invest, to save for something worthwhile. So I had a kid just the other day, he goes, see if I got 10 gold coins. I'm like, congratulations. Come, you can buy anything on the shelf. And they were like, oh, what do I get? <laughs> and, and, and I said, well, first you got to pay for it. Give me a gold coin. So I put my hand out and they, they put it in and we count it out together. So they understand the value that they worked hard to get something. And we are forgetting that. And we're just like punch and kick. Is your kick good? I can give a kid whose kicks were terrible student of the day is because of their attitude, the way right. they, they treated other people. So that's my first thing that we need to consider for adults as well as for children because our parents teaching that to the children. No. Mm. Yeah. They're yeah. letting the school system teach the kids. And that's a shame. And it is a shame. It's terrible. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I know you've got a, a lot of things that you're obviously doing at your school, still training your students, all those types of things. And where where are you going from here? You know, like what what are what's ahead for you in the future? Um, and, and how do people find out more about about what you're doing? Sure, I appreciate that, and, and thank you guys. I want to. You have a great show. Thank you for letting me be part of it. One of the things that we have to remember is that Jennifer and Tommy are doing this because they want to bring great people. And I'm I'm not saying I'm great. I'm saying other their other guests too. <laughs> share great content with you guys. So definitely follow their show, Appreciate log that. in, subscribe, listen to what they're saying because they're doing a service to all of us. So kudos to you. Please don't Thank stop. You, sir. Doing yes. Yes. So my goal is to, uh, I'm in New York. I want to open up the similar location in Arizona. I haven't figured out yet, but I already did a trip to Arizona. I went to the human communication center there and I started looking at locations, both for a home and a business because a, a building to buy a building there, because I want to keep New York, but I want to move it also and do the same exact stuff there. Mm -hmm. But I also want to branch out and have other uh, max martial arts and fitnesses across several places because what i've built here i think can be a great asset to other communities and i'm not looking to take over somebody else's territory we all have an abundance amount of students that we can share if we grow our business the right way the other one is bringing speaking prowess to the world. I'm not looking to impact a few people. I'm going worldwide. Awesome. So how you can find me is speakingprowess.com. I'm on Facebook. If you go to Facebook, it's Sifu Raphael um, G. And uh, LinkedIn is uh, LinkedIn, you know, whatever it is in the back slash is Sifu Raphael. So for me, it's, it's how do we connect? with one another. And it, it's very interesting. And Jennifer, I want to thank you for bringing me on the show. I know, uh, I think it was Jason Flame who might have said something. And that guy's yeah. an incredible human <laughs> being. And what he is... He is, has stepped up for his family and he is just a beautiful soul. Mm -hmm. And 
what he's done for the martial arts community is also great. For sure. Yeah, Jason's been on the show and uh, we've known him for a very long time as well. And and he yeah. definitely is that. He's a, he's a great human being and um, does incredible things. But yeah, we really appreciate having you on the show today, sir. Had some, some good conversations around your background, martial arts, communication in general. I think it was awesome. Um, and we hope and would look forward to seeing you do amazing and great things. So thanks again for being part of our show today, sir. Yes, you too. My pleasure. All right. My pleasure.